I'm mindful this morning when he said, I've got to go into Samaria. But he himself never did. But through the woman. He sent her as his proxy. And an entire city came to hear what the Lord had to say. Amen. This has been a trying year for us all. Some of us have lost loved ones during the season. Some of you, maybe financial status changed. But I want you to know this morning that the Lord has not abandoned his people. this morning. Hallelujah. Whatever it is you face, just keep an open heart yes, to the Lord. Hallelujah. And He'll minister to you. Yes, because young and old are going through now. Yes, We're questioning our government. We're questioning our leadership. The only certainty you and I have Hallelujah. is the Lord. Hallelujah. And I put my trust in Him, in Him alone. I'm not casting off our governments because we need it. I'm not casting off our law enforcement officials simply because they're a bad seed in the midst of them. I would not want to live in a world without law enforcement. Amen. So we need to lift our law enforcement up and pray that God will weed out the bad seed. So I just want, uh, want to encourage you this morning for what you've been through and what you are yet to go through. And so I want to I want to finish the last two messages I started his sacrifice. See, when you understand this. You're able then to endure these times when you question God. And if you say you never question God, you need to repent. Amen. I question it. Say, Lord, why? And so even though I have fullness in me, I still got to grow into that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we will go to Colossians. And I thank God for my wife being here. I, I really do want to just talk to you now. If I shout a little bit, mm -hmm. forgive me. But I, I, I want to teach this because I was sitting there last night and early this morning. It was just a cry in my spirit. Amen. That the saints will grow up into Amen. him. I can't shake that cry. There's, there's something happening in me, and I want the people of God to experience this growing that I'm sensing. And it overwhelms me at times. And so my prayer for you is that you, those of you that I am responsible for as overseeing your soul, that you grab this moment. Amen. Because without appetite, you can't grow. If you're not hungry, you won't eat. And if you won't eat, you won't grow. And my cry as an overseer is that you would be hungry. Not for religious fronts, but hungry for Him. And when you're hungry for Him, when you come in a setting like this, you're going to release what's already in you. Amen. 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 And so we honor the Spirit of Christ. You may be seated. I honor my wife, Pastor Tanya. Thank y'all so much for keeping her lifted up. And the entire family for what we've been through the last few weeks. Honor each of you today. In the spirit of the Lord. Colossians chapter 2. I want to 
review just for a few moments to make sure you we build upon the principle. Because if you ever get this principle down, you will stay hungry. You will eat. And you will grow. All right. And I just want, let me say this in, in the offset here. Uh, I know there's a song out there saying that all I need is a little more Jesus. That is not scriptural. And you need to be careful about releasing that in the atmosphere because if you are born again, you received all that he needs. And so don't get confused with needing more Jesus and having to grow into him. Amen. Amen. There's a difference. I've got everything I need on the inside. That, that young baby right here, right now, has everything in him to be a man. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. But he's got to grow into it. Am I talking to anybody this morning? And God has given us leadership that will help us grow into it. Yeah. Mm. Ah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I said I'm going to just try to walk this thing this morning. Amen. Colossians 2. Let me just read verse 8 through 10 where I left off last time. Hallelujah. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the, tradi after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, which is the head of all principality and power. That's who you have in you. And thank God for my wife today. I love her dearly, but she don't complete me. Because there's times, and I'm sure she would tell you the same, I can be sitting right beside her and she still feel like something is missing. I can be sitting right there and she rubbing on my head and it feels good. But there's something still missing. There's still a yearning in me for something more. Amen. And the reason there is a yearning is because of him. Amen. 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 And so we are complete in him. And so Paul was warning the church, don't get carried away. Don't get kidnapped into philosophy and this vain deceit of man into telling you today that in order for you to make it, you need more than Jesus. See, see, the enemy's philosophy is always telling you that it's always got to be Jesus plus something else. He's telling the, he's trying to convince the church that you are not complete with Him. You need to make sure you do penance, penance, and pray thirty times a day. What's he doing? He's trying to get us to not depend on Jesus alone, but how much work we do. Amen. And whether you pray, if you pray 30 times a day, praise the Lord. That's a great thing. But that is not what's completing you. And so the Bible says he is the fullness of the Godhead. What does that mean to me? It means you have God of all creation says, I want to be expressed in bodily form. So all that God is, 
man supposed to be the expression of yeah. his nature. Yeah. And Jesus was, amen, as one theologian says, he is the complete package. He's the sum total of the Godhead. Yeah. So when Jesus showed up on the earth, fully showed up. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. All right. All right. When Jesus walked the earth, he was the full expression of God's nature. And when we accepted Jesus, we received fullness. There is nothing lacking in you today if you have received him. I didn't say you were moving in everything. But I said there's nothing lacking in you. You don't need no more Jesus. You need the Jesus in you to be released. John said, So I have fullness dwelling in me. Yes. And like this, you know, matter what I have to do now is grow into. Yes. Come on, then the apostle said in yes. Ephesians 4, he said, till we all come. Yes. Yes. What, what was it saying? Till we all grow up. Yes. To where we can fully express yes. what or who is in us. Yes. That's what the world needs now is a people growing up to be the full expression of God's nature. And what is God's nature? His nature is love. So we go right back to that old song, all the world needs now is love. Love is the essence of God's nature. You remember he said in Corinthians, he said, you can prophesy all the mysteries of the king. You can give all that you have to the poor, but if you don't have his nature, he said, you just a big no. So what God wants is not for you to show people how much you prophesy and how much you speak in tongues. What he wants is an expression of his nature to the truth on the street. Has somebody expressed to the truth that God's nature is still love? Yes, sir. says I need an expression yes, of my nature. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for fullness. The only way you're going to be hungry is you've got to start seeking God out. And if you start seeking God out, each time he will give you a nibble or something in that word. And it will draw you back again. Hallelujah. Each time you will start tasting him. And that hunger in you will grow and expand. And if you have an appetite, I say to you today, beloved, you will eat of him. And as you eat of him, you will grow into the one, the full one that's already on the inside. Amen. So that's where we left off verse 10 
saying that we were complete in him. I thank God that it took me 42 years to learn that a woman didn't complete me. That, uh, I'm, you know, my grandmama used to say, son, you have a very hard head. But eventually something get through to you. So I'm grateful today that I'm full. And I need to now know how to release that fullness. Let's move on. And, and I'm, I'm not going to hold you long, but this false teaching has got us so messed up in our dependence in everything and everyone else but Him. We need to grow into Him. Verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. How many of you today understand what natural circumcision is? Got okay, three or four people, or some of y'all just afraid to raise your hand. Understanding natural circumcision is the key to understanding this scripture. Amen. To fully understand what has happened to you. In natural circumcision, y'all know the law that after eight days, according to the law of Moses, the male child was to be circumcised and that circumcision meant a cutting away of the foreskin. Yes. A cutting away. Please mark that, make a note of that, that that circumcision was a cutting away. Let me stress that again. A cutting away of the foreskin. And here, the Bible says, that we too, upon acceptance of Jesus, went through a circumcision. So we, at the time of acceptance of Jesus, and I hope you can grab, grab this because I'm trying to just walk it slow. Jesus performed an operation on us. The moment we accepted him, he cut our spirit. Some of y'all got that I heard. Mm. He took what was old in Diane. And he cut it. Come on. Now, he didn't take the memory away. Because that's something different entirely that you and I are responsible to allow the world transform our mind. But understanding the operation that we went through, everything about you that was old, everything about you that was corrupt, everything about you that was bound in sin, Jesus performed a spiritual circumcision. slow down a minute. What do, you, what do you mean the old nature? The spirit that you normally will operate in lie all the time. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you talking? Are, are you you going to talk back to me today? Listen. I said I'm going to teach this because if you can ever get this principle, I'm telling you, you're going to be something against the enemy's territory. Come on, right. Right. Teach us, teach us. He took that spirit of fornication, <laughs> that adulterous spirit, <laughs> that nature. See, everything about circumcision had to do with nature. <laughs>
Don't you want to do this? Don't you want to do that? And I will listen to that spirit. Come on now. And I will allow the enemy to yeah. convince a new man oh, that he still has oh, an old man. Yeah. Yeah. How can fullness dwell in me and the old nature too? In Christ Jesus. You've got to stop allowing the enemy to come in and condemn you because you're not walking fully into that nature. Come on. And every time the enemy tries to come to you and tell you, look at you, you just lie. You have to you listen, you have to go back to the word and say, I am a new creature. And I have experienced circumcision. And that is no longer my nature. of his fools. Yeah. Yeah. Everything about me I've learned has been cut away. Amen. And I've been carrying the burden of the old activity. And when you come to the knowledge of the truth, you understand that everything about you that God did was never halfway. He cut away all of the old man. And he took residence up in each of us. And now we have the ability to express his full nature. Don't let him convince you that you're still the same old person. Our thoughts must be changed and purged to where we begin to think from the new nature. But I trust in what the word has declared that as Paul is making an argument here about see everything he says in verse 11 he's explaining why verse 9 and 10 happen he's explaining how it happened and Blanchard Grove you hear me now for every believer we have a mission that the old man cannot fulfill the old thinking cannot fulfill it you have to allow that new nature to begin to control your thinking. And how do we do that? We do that by putting the new man in an environment in which he thrives. The new man thrives in the word of God. The new man thrives in prayer. The new man thrives when believers get together and they worship and pray God. That's how the new man thrives. We begin to release him. Because we have received complete salvation. We're just not growing into it. We haven't grown into it. But I say to you today, you are a new creature. And if the enemy has convinced you to continue to lie and cheat, cut him off. Not by being religious, but by going back to what the word says. I have been circumcised. And that circumcision puts me in alignment with God's covenant. To be able to receive all that he is. Hallelujah. Verse 12. Bear it with him. 
in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, when you and I took that old nature that was cut away and buried it, we were then resurrected by the same spirit that raised up Jesus. Not a different spirit. Hear me. We receive the same spirit. That is, I got to keep going back to this, which is the head of all principality and power. That's the spirit that is in each of us. That whenever principalities and powers manifest themselves, you have living in you the head of it all. And listen to verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you. Come on, can you underscore this next two words? All trespasses. Now, please hear me. I want to, I want to just deal with this religious spirit for a moment. You are walking around carrying a burden when you have failed or made mistakes and you feel sometimes unworthy to approach a holy God. When this happens, it is again the spirit of the enemy playing mind tricks on you. Until you grow into it, you're going to make mistakes. Come on, I remember the time when I look at Ariana, she turned 20 on Friday. And I remember, I was just thinking the other day how I would have to be terrified when Tanya was going to the store. Because she was so small then and she had uh, breathing issues. And wouldn't you know that every time Tanya left, she would have an episode. <laughs> and she, I believe she was having an episode because I was being trained. And I'm, I'm spazzing out, I'm trying to call, and then and Tanya would always conveniently either turn her phone off or didn't take it. But I was thinking about how she grew into the young woman she is now. Now think about that concept. How does your little six years old, I'm sure there are things that he's doing now at six that he was not able to do at two. Why? Because he grew into it. Why are you listening to the devil Come on, man. Go ahead. Come to on, put man. such a mandate on you yes. to be perfect outside of Jesus growing you into it? Yes. Yes. Now hear me. I'm not talking about having a license to sin. Yes. I'm talking about when you fall, allowing the enemy yes. to right. condemn you yes. and you forget the circumcision that you already had. Yes. That our nature was buried with him in baptism, and when we bury folk, we don't bury them with a foot out on the ground. There is no visible trace of that old nature. But the enemy will convince. 
convince you otherwise if you keep listening to him. And so all that you would ever do wrong, past, present, and future, has already been forgiven. Now, let me give you this principle of the old covenant and the new. You listen, we still have people praying, Lord, forgive us as we forgive. That's not scripture anymore. Do you know when Jesus taught that, he was teaching the old covenant? When he said, Father, forgive us, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, he was teaching old covenant. You remember now, the old covenant was still in existence until the new was exercised. Oh, I'm trying to help you out. And so Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy that old covenant, I come to fulfill it. So he still had to operate in the old covenant. Until. Come on, come on. Y'all never see some of y'all catch on that. So, see, when Jesus died, the Bible said the New Testament doesn't take effect until the test of the die. And the principles that he taught, why he was operating in the old, he was pointing to the new. You remember he said, the old says you should hate your brother or something. He said, I'll say to you. <laughs> See, he was still teaching new kind of principles. But they were not enacted until he died and he was resurrected. You, you need to study the word of God and understand the times because he always came not to destroy the old covenant but to fulfill it so he would have been out of the will of God had he violated that law and so now that you have received forgiveness forgive like what Now, verse 14, let me see. Yeah. Now, please catch this, and I'm, I'm going to try to get in here. Uh, there's fullness in you. There's certain things that took place in all of us that we have not come to realize. And you've got to guard your ear gate. You've got to guard your eye game. Because there are things the enemy uses to convince us other than what has already taken place. And if you're not careful, if you keep listening and keep watching him, he will convince you that you need to do additional things to truly experience salvation. And the Bible says this, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that what was against us. Now this is New Testament Amen. revelation that Paul is conveying to us about what the old was doing. He says that old writing was against us. Why was the old covenant against us? Because we couldn't keep it. No man could keep it. So he says, it was already stacked against us. We could not keep it. And so what did Jesus do 
when he come along and took upon our sins and circumcised us, he blotted out the handwriting. Which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, ah. nailing it to his cross. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? Every law that was written against us that could, no man could keep, Jesus fulfilled it all and nailed it there. was that if there was any person in debt and when they died that whatever debt there was it was nailed to that cross. All right, all right. All right. All right. Come on, y'all. I know y'all know, 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 know that. That their debt, it was put up there as an open display that they are no longer in debt to this. And everything that was against us, Jesus nailed to the cross and said to the world, they are no longer in debt to it. Why? I paid it all. This is why his, if his sacrifice is more understood, we can go forth in a, in a, in a better way with clarity. We won't have to try to think so much and try to be all of this and that. We we'll understand that each of us has been circumcised and by each of us being circumcised, all the handwriting that was contrary to me was nailed to the cross. That's why we can come and we can shout. We can glorify God because we knew that there was no way possible to fulfill the writing that was contrary to us. It, it said, don't commit adultery. Guess what? The first time I thought it and did it, you were done in. There was y'all understand there was no recourse for the old covenant. When you broke it, you were found guilty of period. There was no mitigating circumstances like a court uses today. Hallelujah. Our indebtedness has been paid. Now let me give you this one principle. When Jesus said that we died like he did, through baptism we were resurrected. When you are dead to something, it no longer exists to you. Now let me give you a principle. How many of y'all ever see a karate kid too? Anybody ever see that? I'm not the one that's seen Karate Kid too. Oh, you saw it, young man? Come on, y'all don't leave me out alone by myself. In that, oh, in that movie, Miyagi had that what used to be his best friend, Sato, that lived his whole life in anger because the woman he was betrothed to marry, Miyagi, was in love with her. She was in love with him, and he made a statement in the village that he was going to marry anyway against tradition. But when it caused such a ruckus and Sato felt disgraced, Miyagi left and came to the States. Where well, years later, he's still carrying that burden. Miyagi has to come home, and he has to face Sato, who's still angry. An old man now, still mad. But the principle here is along the way, Sato had a change of heart. And he had a nephew that he, when the storm was coming on that island, they all came into this one shelter. And Danielson, he was out trying to help this little girl. And he was struggling. So Miyagi was going to run out. And, and, and so Sato told his nephew, go help him. He said, I can't help him. Sato goes out and helps him, and he walks back in, and he says to his nephew, Now I am dead to you. 
What he said was, I no longer exist to you. When you are dead to something, there is no longer a relationship to them or it. You and I are dead to sin. So there should no longer be a relationship to it. That's the principle about being dead. When you have somebody in a family that causes all kinds of problems and you ever say to them, from here on out, I'm dead to you. What you're saying is there will no longer be any relationship, no longer be any communication between us. I don't exist to you. That's the message that Jesus has been trying to convey to the believer is that you are dead as far as sin is concerned. When sin comes looking for you, you don't exist. Are you hearing me? You, you don't exist and you have to know what Jesus' sacrifice did for you. We are alive unto righteousness now, but dead to sin. So when sin comes, we don't have a relationship. I'm dead to you. And you've got to keep telling yourself that each time it comes. Each time the enemy comes to you to try to get you to backbite somebody, you are dead to backbite. How can a dead man be affected by cancer if you inject it in his body in the grave? Can't impact it anymore. Neither can it impact you and I. We are dead to sin. The handwriting against us was nailed to his cross. We are no longer slaves to it. We are alive to Jesus Christ forevermore. And my cry is that we understand we owe the flesh nothing. That Jesus took the debt that I couldn't pay. And he nailed it to the cross. In open display saying, they are no longer slaves. They are no longer in debt. They are free. That's what it's all about, beloved, when it comes to understanding salvation and what his life really brought us. And it's time to walk in the newness of life. My heart's cry is to see you embrace that truth and begin to apply that truth and no longer walk around feeling obligated to your flesh. He cut the old nature away. It was buried. Now let him renew the mind and erase the memory of it. That's our obligation today. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet.